Chapter 5 Our March into the Desert We had killed nine elephants, and it took us two days to cut out the tusks, and having brought them into camp, to bury them carefully in the sand under a large tree, which made a conspicuous mark for miles round. It was a wonderfully fine lot of ivory. I never saw a better, averaging as it did between forty and fifty pounds a tusk. The tusks of the great bull that killed poor Kiva scaled one hundred and seventy pounds the pair, so nearly as we could judge. As for Kiva himself, we buried what remained of him in an ant-bear hole, together with an assegai to protect himself with on his journey to a better world. On the third day we marched again, hoping that we might live to return to dig up our buried ivory. And in due course, after a long and wearisome tramp and many adventures which I have not space to detail, we reached Santanda's Corral, near the Lukanga River, the real starting point of our expedition. Very well do I recollect our arrival at that place. To the right was a scattered native settlement with a few stone cattle kraals and some cultivated lands down by the water where these savages grew their scanty supply of grain. And beyond it stretched great tracts of waving veld covered with tall grass over which herds of the smaller game were wandering. To the left lay the vast desert. This spot appears to be the outpost of the fertile country, and it would be difficult to say to what natural causes such an abrupt change in the character of the soil is due. But so it is. Just below our encampment flowed a little stream, on the farther side of which is a stony slope, the same down which, twenty years before, I had seen poor Silvestre creeping back after his attempt to reach Solomon's Mines, and beyond that slope begins the waterless desert, covered with a species of Karoo shrub. It was evening when we pitched our camp, and the great ball of the sun was sinking into the desert, sending glorious rays of many-colored light flying all over its vast expanse. Leaving good to superintend the arrangement of our little camp, I took Sir Henry with me, and walking to the top of the slope opposite, we gazed across the desert. The air was very clear, and far, far away I could distinguish the faint blue outlines, here and there capped with white, of the Suleiman Berg. There, I said, there is the wall round Solomon's Mines, but God knows if we shall ever climb it. "'My brother should be there, and if he is, I shall reach him somehow,' said Sir Henry, "'in that tone of quiet confidence which marked the man. "'I hope so,' I answered, and turned to go back to the camp, "'when I saw that we were not alone. "'Behind us, also gazing earnestly towards the far-off mountain, "'stood the great Kafir Umbopa. "'The Zulu spoke when he saw that I had observed him.' "'addressing Sir Henry, to whom he had attached himself. "'Is it to that land that thou wouldst journey, Inkubu? "'A native word, meaning, I believe, an elephant, "'and the name given to Sir Henry by the Kafirs,' "'he said, pointing toward the mountain with his broad assegai. "'I asked him sharply what he meant by addressing his master in that familiar way. It is very well for natives to have a name for one among themselves, but it is not decent that they should call a white man by their heathenish appellations to his face. The Zulu laughed a quiet little laugh which angered me. How dost thou know that I am not the equal of the Inkosi whom I serve, he said. He is of a royal house, no doubt. One can see it in his size and by his mien. So mayhap am I. At least I am as great a man. Be my mouth, O Makumazan, and say my words to the Inkus Inkubu, my master, for I would speak to him and to thee. I was angry with the man, for I am not accustomed to be talked to in that way by Kafirs, but somehow he impressed me, 
and besides I was curious to know what he had to say. So I translated, expressing my opinion at the same time that he was an impudent fellow, and that his swagger was outrageous. "'Yes, Umbopa,' answered Sir Henry, "'I would journey there. "'The desert is wide, and there is no water in it. "'The mountains are high and covered with snow, "'and man cannot say what lies beyond them, "'behind the place where the sun sets. "'How shalt thou come hither, Inkubu, "'and wherefore dost thou go?' "'I translated again. "'Tell him,' answered Sir Henry, that I go because I believe that a man of my blood, my brother, has gone there before me, and I journey to seek him. That is so, Inkubu. A Hottentot I met on the road told me that a white man went out into the desert two years ago towards those mountains with one servant, a hunter. They never came back. How do you know it was my brother? asked Sir Henry. Nay, nee, I know not. But the Hottentot, when I asked what the white man was like, said that he had thine eyes and a black beard. He said, too, that the name of the hunter with him was Jim, that he was a Bekawana hunter and wore clothes. There is no doubt about it, said I. I knew Jim well. Sir Henry nodded. I was sure of it, he said. If George set his mind upon a thing, he generally did it. It was always so from his boyhood. If he meant to cross the Suleiman Berg, he has crossed it, unless some accident overtook him, and we must look for him on the other side. Umbopa understood English, though he rarely spoke it. It is a far journey, Inkubu, he put in, and I translated his remark. Yes, answered Sir Henry, it is far, but there is no journey upon this earth that a man may not make if he sets his heart to it. There is nothing, Umbopa, that he cannot do. There are no mountains he may not climb. There are no deserts he cannot cross, save a mountain and a desert of which you are spared the knowledge. If love leads him, and he holds his life in his hands, counting it as nothing, ready to keep it or lose it, as heaven above may order. I translated. Great words, my father, answered the Zulu. I always called him a Zulu, though he was not really one. Great swelling words fit to fill the mouth of a man. Thou art right, my father Inkabu. Listen, what is life? It is a feather. It is the seed of the grass, blown hither and thither, sometimes multiplying itself and dying in the act, sometimes carried away into the heavens. But if that seed be good and heavy, it may, perchance, travel a little way on the road it wills. It is well to try and journey one's road, and to fight with the air. Man must die. At the worst, he can but die a little sooner. I will go with thee across the desert and over the mountains, unless, perchance, I fall to the ground on the way, my father. He paused a while, and then went on with one of those strange bursts of rhetorical eloquence that Zulus sometimes indulge in, which to my mind, full though they are of vain repetitions, show that the race is by no means devoid of poetic instinct and of intellectual power. What is life? Tell me, O oh, white men who are wise, who know the secrets of the world, and of the world of stars, and the world that lies above and around the stars, who flash your words from afar without a voice. Tell me, white man, the secret of our life, whither it goes and whence it comes. You cannot answer me, you know not. Listen, I will answer. Out of the dark we came, into the dark we go. Like a storm-driven bird at night we fly out of the nowhere. For a moment our wings are seen in the light of the fire. And lo, we are gone again into the nowhere. Life is nothing. Life is all. It is the hand with which we hold off death. It is the glow-worm that shines in the night-time and is black in the morning. It is the white breath of the oxen in winter. It is the little shadow that runs across the grass and loses itself at sunset. 
"'You are a strange man,' said Sir Henry, when he had ceased. "'Umbopa laughed. "'It seems to me that we are much alike, Inkubu. "'Perhaps I seek a brother over the mountains.' "'I looked at him suspiciously. "'What dost thou mean?' I asked. "'What dost thou know of those mountains?' "'A little, a very little.' There is a strange land yonder, a land of witchcraft and beautiful things, a land of brave people, and of trees and streams, and snowy peaks, and of a great white road. I have heard of it. But what is the good of talking? It grows dark. Those who live to see will see. Again I looked at him doubtfully. The man knew too much. You need not fear me. Macumazahn, he said, interpreting my look. I dig no holes for you to fall in. I make no plots. If we ever cross these mountains behind the sun, I will tell what I know. But death sits upon them. Be wise and turn back. Go and hunt elephants, my masters. I have spoken." and without another word he lifted his spear in salutation and returned towards the camp where shortly afterwards we found him cleaning a gun like any other kaffir. "'That is an odd man,' said Sir Henry. "'Yes,' I answered, "'too odd by half. I don't like his little ways. He knows something, and he will not speak out. But I suppose it is no use quarreling with him.' We were in for a curious trip, and a mysterious Zulu won't make much difference one way or another. Next day we made our arrangements for starting. Of course, it was impossible to drag our heavy elephant rifles and other kit with us across the desert. So, dismissing our bearers, we made an arrangement with an old native who had a corral close by to take care of them till we returned. It went to my heart to leave such things as these sweet tools to the tender mercies of an old thief of a savage, whose greedy eyes I could see gloating over them. But I took some precautions. First of all, I loaded all the rifles, placing them at full cock, and informed him that if he touched them they would go off. He tried the experiment instantly with my eight-bore, and it did go off, and blew a hole right through one of his oxen, which were just then being driven up to the corral, to say nothing of knocking him head over heels with the recoil. He got up considerably startled, and not at all pleased at the loss of the ox, which he had the impudence to ask me to pay for, and nothing would induce him to touch the guns again. "'Put the live devils out of the way up there in the thatch,' he said." or they will murder us all. Then I told him that when we came back, if one of those things was missing, I would kill him and his people by witchcraft, and if we died and he tried to steal the rifles, I would come and haunt him and turn his cattle mad and his milk sour till life was a weariness, and he would make the devils in the guns come out and talk to him in a way he did not like and generally gave him a good idea of judgment to come. After that he promised to look after them as though they were his father's spirit. He was a very superstitious old kaffir and a great villain. Having thus disposed of our superfluous gear, we arranged the kit we five, Sir Henry, Good, myself, Umbopa, and the Hottentot Ventvogel, were to take with us on our journey. It was small enough, but do what we would, we could not get its weight down under about 40 pounds a man. This is what it consisted of. The three express rifles and 200 rounds of ammunition. The two Winchester repeating rifles for Umbopa and Ventvogel, with 200 rounds of cartridges. Five Cochrane's water bottles, each holding four pints. Five blankets. 25 pounds weight of biltong, i.e. sun-dried game flesh. 
ten pounds weight of best mixed beads for gifts. A selection of medicine, including an ounce of quinine and one or two small surgical instruments. Our knives, a few sundries such as a compass, matches, a pocket filter, tobacco, a trowel, a bottle of brandy, and the clothes we stood in. This was our total equipment, a small one indeed for such a venture, but we dared not attempt to carry more. Indeed, that load was a heavy one per man with which to travel across the burning desert, for in such places every additional ounce tells. But we could not see our way to reducing the weight. There was nothing taken but what was absolutely necessary. With great difficulty, and by the promise of a present of a good hunting knife each, I succeeded in persuading three wretched natives from the village to come with us for the first stage, twenty miles, and to carry a large round gourd holding a gallon of water apiece. My object was to enable us to refill our water bottles after the first night's march, for we determined to start in the cool of the evening. I gave out to these natives that we were going to shoot ostriches, with which the desert abounded. They jabbered and shrugged their shoulders, saying that we were mad and should perish of thirst, which I must say seemed probable. But being desirous of obtaining the knives, which were almost unknown treasures up there, they consented to come, having probably reflected that, after all, our subsequent extinction would be no affair of theirs. All next day we rested and slept, and at sunset ate a hearty meal of fresh beef washed down with tea, the last, as good remark sadly, we were likely to drink for many a long day. Then, having made our final preparations, we lay down and waited for the moon to rise. At last, about nine o'clock, up she came in all her glory, flooding the wild country with light and throwing a silver sheen on the expanse of rolling desert before us, which looked as solemn and quiet and as alien to man as the star-studded firmament above. We rose up, and in a few minutes were ready, and yet we hesitated a little, as human nature is prone to hesitate on the threshold of an irrevocable step. We three white men stood by ourselves. Umbopa, as a guy in hand and a rifle across his shoulders, looked out fixedly across the desert a few paces ahead of us, while the hired natives with the gourds of water and Ventvogel were gathered in a little knot behind. Gentlemen, said Sir Henry presently in his deep voice, we are going on about as strange a journey as men can make in this world. It is very doubtful if we can succeed in it. But we are three men who will stand together for good or for evil to the last. Now, before we start, let us for a moment pray to the power who shapes the destinies of men and who ages since has marked out our paths, that it may please him to direct our steps in accordance with his will. Taking off his hat, for the space of a minute or so, he covered his face with his hands, and Good and I did likewise. I do not say that I am a first-rate praying man. Few hunters are. And as for Sir Henry, I never heard him speak like that before, and only once since, though deep down in his heart I believe he is very religious. Good, too, is pious, though apt to swear. Anyhow, I do not remember, excepting on one single occasion, ever putting up a better prayer in my life than I did during that minute and somehow I felt the happier for it. Our future was so completely unknown, and I think that the unknown and the awful always bring a man nearer to his maker. And now, said Sir Henry, trek. So we started. We had nothing to guide ourselves by except the distant mountains and old José da Silvestre's chart which, considering that it was drawn by a dying and half-distraught man on a fragment of linen three centuries ago, was not a very satisfactory sort of thing to work with. 
Still, our sole hope of success depended upon it, such as it was. If we failed in finding that pool of bad water which the old dom marked as being situated in the middle of the desert, about sixty miles from our starting point, and as far from the mountains, in all probability we must perish miserably of thirst. But to my mind the chances of our finding it in that great sea of sand and Karoo scrub seemed almost infinitesimal. Even supposing that Da Silvestra had marked the pool correctly, what was there to prevent its having been dried up by the sun generations ago, or trampled in by game, or filled in with the drifting sand? On we tramped, silently as shades, through the night and in the heavy sand. The Karoo brushes caught our feet and retarded us, and the sand worked into our veltschuns and good shooting boots, so that every few miles we had to stop and empty them. But still the night kept fairly cool, though the atmosphere was thick and heavy, giving a sort of creamy feel to the air, and we made fair progress. It was very silent and lonely there in the desert, oppressively so indeed. Good felt this, and once began to whistle, The Girl I Left Behind Me, but the notes sounded lugubrious in that vast place, and he gave it up. Shortly afterwards, a little incident occurred which, though it startled us at the time, gave rise to a laugh. Good was leading as the holder of the compass, which, being a sailor, of course he understood thoroughly. And we were toiling along in single file behind him, when suddenly we heard the sound of an exclamation, and he vanished. Next second, there arose all around us a most extraordinary hubbub, snorts, groans, and wild sounds of rushing feet. In the faint light, too, we could descry dim galloping forms half hidden by wreaths of sand. The natives threw down their loads and prepared to bolt, but remembering there was nowhere to run to, they cast themselves upon the ground and howled out that it was ghosts. As for Sir Henry and myself, we stood amazed, nor was our amazement lessened when we perceived the form of Good careening off in the direction of the mountains, apparently mounted on the back of a horse, and hallowing wildly. In another second he threw up his arms, and we heard him come to the earth with a thud. Then I saw what had happened. We had stumbled upon a herd of sleeping guaga, onto the back of one of which Good had actually fallen, and the brute, naturally enough, got up, and made off with him. Calling out to the others that it was all right, I ran towards Good, much afraid lest he should be hurt. But to my great relief I found him sitting in the sand, his eyeglass still fixed firmly in his eye, rather shaken and very much frightened, but not in any way injured. After this we traveled on without any further misadventure till about one o'clock when we called a halt, and having drunk a little water, not much, for water was precious, and rested for half an hour we started again. On, on we went, till at last the east began to blush like the cheek of a girl. Then there came faint rays of primrose light that changed presently to golden bars, through which the dawn glided out across the desert. The stars grew pale, and paler still, till at last they vanished. The golden moon waxed wan, and her mountain ridges stood out against her sickly face like the bones on the cheek of a dying man. Then came spear upon spear of light flashing far away across the boundless wilderness, piercing and firing the veils of mist till the desert was draped in a tremulous golden glow, and it was day. Still we did not halt though by this time we should have been glad enough to do so, for we knew that when once the sun was fully up it would be almost impossible for us to travel. At length, about an hour later, we spied a little pile of boulders rising out of the plain, and to this we dragged ourselves. As luck would have it, here we found an overhanging slab of rock carpeted beneath with smooth sand, which afforded a most grateful shelter from the heat. Underneath this we crept, and each of us, having drunk some water and eaten a bit of biltong, 
we lay down and were soon sound asleep. It was three o'clock in the afternoon before we woke to find our bearers preparing to return. They had seen enough of the desert already, and no number of knives would have tempted them to come a step farther. So we took a hearty drink, and having emptied our water bottles, filled them up again from the gourds that they had brought with them, and then we watched them depart on their twenty miles tramp home. At half past four we also started. It was lonely and desolate work, for with the exception of a few ostriches, there was not a single living creature to be seen on all the vast expanse of sandy plain. Evidently it was too dry for game, and with the exception of a deadly-looking cobra or two, we saw no reptiles. One insect, however, we found abundant, and that was the common or house fly. There they came, not as single spies, but in battalions, as I think the Old Testament says somewhere. Editor's Note Readers must beware of accepting Mr. Quartermain's references as accurate as it has been found some are prone to do. Although his reading evidently was limited, the impression produced by it upon his mind was mixed. Thus to him the Old Testament and Shakespeare were interchangeable authorities. Go where you will, you find him, and so it must have been always. I have seen him enclosed in amber, which is, I was told, quite half a million years old, looking exactly like his descendant of today. And I have little doubt but that when the last man lies dying on the earth, he will be buzzing around, if this event happens to occur in summer, watching for an opportunity to settle on his nose. At sunset we halted, waiting for the moon to rise. At last she came up, beautiful and serene as ever, and with one halt about two o'clock in the morning, we trudged on wearily through the night, till at last the welcome sun put a period to our labors. We drank a little, and flung ourselves down on the sand, thoroughly tired out, and soon were all asleep. There was no need to set a watch, for we had nothing to fear from anybody or anything in that vast, untenanted plain. Our only enemies were heat, thirst, and flies but far rather would I have faced any danger from man or beast than that awful trinity. This time we were not so lucky as to find a sheltering rock to guard us from the glare of the sun, with the result that about seven o'clock we woke up, experiencing the exact sensations one would attribute to a beefsteak on a gridiron. We were literally being baked through and through. The burning sun seemed to be sucking our very blood out of us. We sat up and gasped. Whew, said I, grabbing at the halo of flies which buzzed cheerfully round my head. The heat did not affect them. My word, said Sir Henry. It is hot, echoed Good. It was hot indeed, and there was not a bit of shelter to be found. Look where we would, there was no rock or tree, nothing but an unending glare, rendered dazzling by the heated air that danced over the surface of the desert as it dances over a red-hot stove. What is to be done? asked Sir Henry. We can't stand this for long. We looked at each other blankly. I have it, said Good. We must dig a hole, get in it, and cover ourselves with the Karoo bushes. It did not seem a very promising suggestion, but at least it was better than nothing, so we set to work, and with the trowel we had brought with us and the help of our hands, in about an hour we had succeeded in delving out a patch of ground some ten feet long by twelve wide to the depth of two feet. Then we cut a quantity of low scrub with our hunting knives, and creeping into the hole, pulled it over us all, with the exception of Ventvogel, on whom, being a Hottentot, the heat had no particular effect. This gave us some slight shelter from the burning rays of the sun. But the atmosphere in that amateur grave can be better imagined than described. The black hole of Calcutta must have been a fool to it. 
Indeed, to this moment I do not know how we live through the day. There we lay panting, and every now and again moistening our lips from our scanty supply of water. Had we followed our inclinations, we should have finished all we possessed in the first two hours, but we were forced to exercise the most rigid care, for if our water failed us, we knew that very soon we must perish miserably. But everything has an end, if only you live long enough to see it, and somehow that miserable day wore on towards evening. About three o'clock in the afternoon, we determined that we could bear it no longer. It would be better to die walking than to be killed slowly by heat and thirst in this dreadful hole. So taking each of us a little drink from our fast diminishing supply of water, now warm to about the same temperature as a man's blood, we staggered forward. We had then covered some fifty miles of wilderness. If the reader will refer to the rough copy and translation of old da Silvestra's map, he will see that the desert is marked as measuring 40 leagues across, and the pan-bad water is set down as being about in the middle of it. Now 40 leagues is 120 miles, consequently we ought at the most to be within 12 or 15 miles of the water, if any should really exist. Through the afternoon we crept slowly and painfully along, scarcely doing more than a mile and a half in an hour. At sunset we rested again, waiting for the moon, and after drinking a little managed to get some sleep. Before we lay down, Umbopa pointed out to us a slight and indistinct hillock on the flat surface of the plain, about eight miles away. At the distance it looked like an anthill, and as I was dropping off to sleep, I fell to wondering what it could be. With the moon we marched again, feeling dreadfully exhausted, and suffering tortures from thirst and prickly heat. Nobody who has not felt it can know what we went through. We walked no longer, we staggered, now and again falling from exhaustion, and being obliged to call a halt every hour or so. We had scarcely energy left in us to speak. Up to this, Good had chatted and joked, for he is a merry fellow, but now he had not a joke in him. At last, about two o'clock, utterly worn out in body and mind, we came to the foot of the queer hill, or sand copy, which at first sight resembled a gigantic ant heap about a hundred feet high, and covering at the base nearly two acres of ground. Here we halted, and driven to it by our desperate thirst, sucked down our last drops of water. We had but half a pint ahead, and each of us could have drunk a gallon. Then we lay down. Just as I was dropping off to sleep, I heard Mbopa remark to himself in Zulu, if we cannot find water, we shall all be dead before the moon rises tomorrow. I shuddered, hot as it was. The near prospect of such an awful death is not pleasant. But even the thought of it could not keep me from sleeping. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 Water, Water Two hours later, that is, about four o'clock, I woke up, for so soon as the first heavy demand of bodily fatigue had been satisfied, the torturing thirst from which I was suffering asserted itself. I could sleep no more. I had been dreaming that I was bathing in a running stream, with green banks and trees upon them, and I awoke to find myself in this arid wilderness, and to remember, as Umbopa had said, that if we did not find water this day, we must perish miserably. No human creature could live long without water in that heat. I sat up and rubbed my grimy face with my dry and horny hands, as my lips and eyelids were stuck together, and it was only after some friction and with an effort that I was able to open them. It was not far from dawn, 
but there was none of the bright feel of dawn in the air, which was thick with a hot murkiness that I cannot describe. The others were still sleeping. Presently it began to grow light enough to read, so I drew out a little pocket copy of the Ingoldsby Legends, which I had brought with me, and read The Jackdaw of Reims. When I got to where a nice little boy held a golden ewer, embossed and filled with water as pure as any that flows between Reims and Namur. Literally, I smacked my cracking lips, or rather tried to smack them. The mere thought of that pure water made me mad. If the cardinal had been there with his bell, book, and candle, I would have whipped in and drunk his water up. Yes, even if he had filled it already with the suds of soap, worthy of washing the hands of the Pope, and I knew that the whole consecrated curse of the Catholic Church should fall upon me for so doing. I almost think that I must have been a little light-headed with thirst, weariness, and the want of food, for I fell to thinking how astonished the Cardinal and his nice little boy and the jackdaw would have looked to see a burnt-up, brown-eyed, grizzly-haired little elephant-hutter suddenly bound between them, put his dirty face into the basin and swallow every drop of the precious water. The idea amused me so much that I laughed, or rather cackled aloud, which woke the others, and they began to rub their dirty faces and drag their gummed-up lips and eyelids apart. As soon as we were all well awake, we began to discuss the situation, which was serious enough. Not a drop of water was left. We turned the bottles upside down and licked the tops, but it was a failure. They were dry as a bone. Good, who had charge of the flask of brandy, got it out and looked at it longingly. But Sir Henry promptly took it away from him, for to drink raw spirit would only have been to precipitate the end. If we do not find water, we shall die, he said. If we can trust to the old Dom's map, there should be some about, I said, but nobody seemed to derive much satisfaction from this remark. It was so evident that no great faith could be put in the map. Now it was gradually growing light, and as we sat staring blankly at each other, I observed the Hottentot Ventvogel rise and begin to walk about with his eyes on the ground. Presently he stopped short, and uttering a guttural exclamation pointed to the earth what is it we exclaimed and rising simultaneously we went to where he was standing staring at the sand well i said it is fresh sp springbok spore what of it springboks do not go far from water he answered in dutch no i answered i forgot and thank god for it this little discovery put new life into us, for it is wonderful when a man is in a desperate position how he catches at the slightest hope and feels almost happy. On a dark night, a single star is better than nothing. Meanwhile, Vent Vogel was lifting his snub nose and sniffing the hot air for all the world like an old Impala ram who scents danger. Presently he spoke again. I smell water, he said. Then we fell quite jubilant, for we knew what a wonderful instinct these wild-bred men possess. Just at that moment the sun came up gloriously, and revealed so grand a sight to our astonished eyes that for a moment or two we even forgot our thirst. There, not more than forty or fifty miles from us, glittering like silver in the early rays of the morning sun, soared Sheba's breasts and stretching away for hundreds of miles on either side of them, ran the great Suleiman Berg. Now that sitting here I attempt to describe the extraordinary grandeur and beauty of that sight, language seems to fail me. I am impotent even before its memory. Straight before us rose two enormous mountains, the likes of which are not, I believe, to be seen in Africa, if indeed there are any other such in the world, measuring each of them at least 15,000 feet in height, standing not more than a dozen miles apart 
linked together by a precipitous cliff of rock, and towering in awful white solemnity straight into the sky. These mountains placed thus, like the pillars of a gigantic gateway, are shaped after the fashion of a woman's breasts, and at times the mists and shadows beneath them take the form of a recumbent woman, veiled mysteriously in sleep. Their bases swell gently from the plain, looking at that distance perfectly round and smooth, and upon the top of each is a vast hillock covered with snow exactly corresponding to the nipple on the female breast. The stretch of cliff that connects them appears to be some thousands of feet in height, and perfectly precipitous, and on each flank of them, so far as the eye can reach, extend similar lines of cliff, broken only here and there by flat table-topped mountains, something like the world-famed one at Cape Town, a formation, by the way, that is very common in Africa. To describe the comprehensive grandeur of that view is beyond my powers. There was something so inexpressibly solemn and overpowering about those huge volcanoes, for doubtless they are extinct volcanoes, that it quite awed us. For a while the morning lights played upon the snow and the brown and swelling masses beneath, and then, as though to veil the majestic sight from our curious eyes, strange vapors and clouds gathered and increased around the mountains, till presently we could only trace their pure and gigantic outlines, showing ghost-like through the fleecy envelope. Indeed, as we afterwards discovered, usually they were wrapped in this gauze-like mist, which doubtless accounted for our not having seen them more clearly before. Sheba's breasts had scarcely vanished into cloud-clad privacy before our thirst, literally a burning question, reasserted itself. It was all very well for Ventvogel to say that he smelt water, but we could see no signs of it, look which way we would. So far as the eye might reach, there was nothing but arid, sweltering sand and Karoo scrub. We walked round the hillock, and gazed about anxiously on the other side, but it was the same story. Not a drop of water could be found. There was no indication of a pan, a pool, or a spring. You are a fool, I said angrily to Ventvogel. There is no water. But still he lifted his ugly snub nose, sniffed. I smell it, boss, he answered. It is somewhere in the air. Yes, I said, no doubt it is in the clouds, and about two months hence it will fall and wash our bones. Sir Henry stroked his yellow beard thoughtfully. Perhaps it is on the top of the hill, he suggested. Rot, said Good. Who ever heard of water being found at the top of a hill? Let us go and look, I put in and hopelessly enough we scrambled up the sandy sides of the hillock, Umbopa leading. Presently he stopped as though he was petrified. Nanzi Amanzi, that is, here is water, he cried with a loud voice. We rushed up to him, and there, sure enough, in a deep cut or indentation on the very top of the sand copy, was an undoubted pool of water. How it came to be in such a strange place we did not stop to inquire, nor did we hesitate at its black and unpleasant appearance. It was water or a good imitation of it, and that was enough for us. We gave a bound and a rush, and in another second we were all down on our stomachs, sucking up the uninviting fluid as though it were nectar fit for the gods. Heavens, how we did drink! Then, when we had done drinking, we tore off our clothes and sat in the pool, absorbing the moisture through our parched skins. You, Harry, my boy, who have only to turn a couple of taps to summon hot and cold from an unseen, vasty cistern, can have little idea of the luxury of that muddy wallow in brackish, tepid water. After a while we rose from it, refreshed indeed, and fell to on our biltong, of which we had scarcely been able to touch a mouthful for twenty-four hours, 
and ate our fill. Then we smoked a pipe and lay down by the side of that blessed pool under the overhanging shadow of its bank and slept till noon. All that day we rested there by the water, thanking our stars that we had been lucky enough to find it, bad as it was, and not forgetting to render a due share of gratitude to the shade of the long-departed da Silvestra, who had set its position down so accurately on the tail of his shirt. The wonderful thing to us was that the pan should have lasted so long, and the only way in which I can account for this is on the supposition that it is fed by some spring deep down in the sand. Having filled both ourselves and our water bottles as full as possible, in far better spirits we started off again with the moon. That night we covered nearly five and twenty miles, but needless to say found no more water, though we were lucky enough the following day to get a little shade behind some ant heaps. When the sun rose and for a while cleared away the mysterious mists, Suleiman's Berg, with the two majestic breasts, now only about twenty miles off, seemed to be towering right above us and looked grander than ever. At the approach of evening, we marched again, and to cut a long story short, by daylight next morning found ourselves upon the lowest slopes of Sheba's left breast, for which we had been steadily steering. By this time our water was exhausted once more, and we were suffering severely from thirst, nor indeed could we see any chance of relieving it till we reached the snow line far, far above us. After resting an hour or two, driven to it by our torturing thirst, we went on, toiling painfully in the burning heat up the lava slopes, for we found that the huge base of the mountain was composed entirely of lava beds belched from the bowels of the earth in some far past age. By eleven o'clock we were utterly exhausted and generally speaking in a very bad state indeed. The lava clinker over which we must drag ourselves, though smooth compared with some clinker I have heard of, such as that on the island of Ascension, for instance, was yet rough enough to make our feet very sore, and this, together with our other miseries, had pretty well finished us. A few hundred yards above us were some large lumps of lava, and toward these we steered with the intention of lying down beneath their shade. We reached them, and to our surprise, so far as we had a capacity for surprise left in us, on a little plateau or ridge close by, we saw that the clinker was covered with a dense green growth. Evidently, soil formed of decomposed lava had rested there, and in due course had become the receptacle of seeds deposited by birds. But we did not take much further interest in that green growth, for one cannot live on grass like Nebuchadnezzar. That requires a special dispensation of providence and peculiar digestive organs. So we sat down under the rocks and groaned, and for one I wish heartily that we had never started on this fool's errand. As we were sitting there, I saw Umbopa get up and hobble towards the patch of green, and a few minutes afterwards, to my great astonishment, I perceived that usually very dignified individual dancing and shouting like a maniac and waving something green. Off we all scrambled towards him as fast as our wearied limbs would carry us, hoping that he had found water. "'What is it, Umbopa, son of a fool?' I shouted in Zulu. "'It is food and water, Makumazan,' and again he waved the green thing. Then I saw what he had found. It was a melon. We had hit upon a patch of wild melons, thousands of them, and dead ripe. "'Melons!' I yelled to Good, who was next to me and in another minute his false teeth were fixed in one of them. I think we ate about six each before we had done, and, and poor fruit as they were, I doubt if I ever thought anything nicer. But melons are not very nutritious, and when we had satisfied our thirst with their pulpy substance and put a stock to cool by the simple process of cutting them in two and setting them and on in the hot sun to grow cold by evaporation, 
we began to feel exceedingly hungry. We had still some biltong left, but our stomachs turned from biltong, and besides, we were obliged to be very sparing of it, for we could not say when we should find more food. Just at this moment, a lucky thing chanced. Looking across the desert, I saw a flock of about ten large birds flying straight towards us. Skit, boss, skit! Shoot, master, shoot! whispered the Hottentot, throwing himself on his face, an example which we all followed. Then I saw that the birds were a flock of pow, or bustards, and that they would pass within fifty yards of my head. Taking one of the repeating Winchesters, I waited till they were very nearly over us, and then jumped to my feet. On seeing me, the pow bunched up together, as I expected that they would, and I fired two shots straight into the thick of them. And as luck would have, it brought down one, a fine fellow that weighed about twenty pounds. In half an hour we had a fire made of dry melon stalks, and he was toasting over it, and we made such a feed as we had not tasted for a week. We ate that pow, nothing was left of him but his leg bones in his beak, and we felt not a little the better afterwards. That night we went on again with the moon, carrying as many melons as we could with us, as we ascended, we found the air grew cooler and cooler, which was a great relief to us, and at dawn, so far as we could judge, we were not more than about a dozen miles from the snow line. Here we discovered more melons, and so had no longer any anxiety about water, for we knew that we should soon get plenty of snow. But the ascent had now become very precipitous, and we made but slow progress, not more than a mile an hour. Also that night we ate our last morsel of biltong. As yet, with the exception of the pow, we had seen no living thing on the mountain, nor had we come across a single spring or stream of water, which struck us as very odd, considering the expanse of snow above us, which must, we thought, melt sometimes. But as we afterwards discovered, owing to a cause which is quite beyond my power to explain, all the streams flowed down upon the north side of the mountain. Now we began to grow very anxious about food. We had escaped death by thirst, but it seemed probable that it was only to die of hunger. The events of the next three miserable days are best described by copying the entries made at the time in my notebook. 21st May. Started 11 a.m., finding the atmosphere quite cold enough to travel by day and carrying some water melons with us, struggled on all day, but found no more melons, having evidently passed out of their district, saw no game of any sort, halted for the night at sundown, having had no food for many hours, suffered much during the night from cold. 22nd. Started at sunrise again, feeling very faint and weak. Only made about five miles all day. Found some patches of snow of which we ate, but nothing else. Camped at night under the edge of a great plateau. Cold, bitter. Drank a little brandy each and huddled ourselves together, each wrapped up in his blanket, to keep ourselves alive. Are now suffering frightfully from starvation and weariness. Thought that Ventvogel would have died during the night. 23rd. Struggled forward once more as soon as the sun was well up, and had thawed our limbs a little. We are now in a dreadful plight, and I fear that unless we get food this will be our last day's journey. But little brandy left. Good Sir Henry and Umbopa bear up wonderfully, but Ventvogel is in a very bad way. Like most Hottentots he cannot stand cold. Pangs of hunger not so bad, but have a sort of numb feeling about the stomach. Others say the same. We are now on a level with the precipitous chain or wall of lava, linking the two breasts, and the view is glorious. Behind us the glowing desert rolls away to the horizon, and before us lie mile upon mile of smooth hard snow, almost level, 
but swelling gently upwards, out of the center of which the nipple of the mountain, that appears to be some miles in circumference, rises about 4,000 feet into the sky. Not a living thing is to be seen. God help us, I fear that our time has come. And now I will drop the journal, partly because it is not very interesting reading. Also, what follows requires telling rather more fully. All that day, the 23rd May, we struggled slowly up the incline of snow, lying down from time to time to rest. A strange gaunt crew we must have looked, while, laden as we were, we dragged our weary feet over the dazzling plain, glaring round us with hungry eyes. Not that there was much use in glaring, for we could see nothing to eat. We did not accomplish more than seven miles that day. Just before sunset, we found ourselves exactly under the nipple of Sheba's left breast, which towered thousands of feet into the air, a vast, smooth hillock of frozen snow. Weak as we were, we could not but appreciate the wonderful scene, made even more splendid by the flying rays of light from the setting sun, which here and there stained the snow blood-red and crowned the great dome above us with a diadem of glory. "'I say,' gasped Good presently, "'we ought to be somewhere near that cave the old gentleman wrote about.' Yes, said I, if there is a cave. Come, Quartermain, groaned Sir Henry. Don't talk like that. I have every faith in the dom. Remember the water. We shall find the place soon. If we don't find it before dark, we are dead men. That is all about it, was my consolatory reply. For the next ten minutes we trudged in silence, when suddenly Umbopa, who was marching along beside me, wrapped in his blanket, and with a leather belt strapped so tightly round his stomach to make his hunger small, as he said, that his waist looked like a girl's, caught me by the arm. Look, he said, pointing towards the springing slope of the nipple. I followed his glance, and some two hundred yards from us perceived what appeared to be a hole in the snow. It is the cave! said Umbopa. We made the best of our way to the spot, and found sure enough that the hole was the mouth of a cavern, no doubt the same as that of which da Silvestra wrote. We were not too soon, for just as we reached shelter the sun went down with startling rapidity, leaving the world nearly dark, for in these latitudes there is but little twilight. So we crept into the cave, which did not appear to be very big, and huddling ourselves together for warmth, swallowed what remained of our brandy, barely a mouthful each, and tried to forget our miseries in sleep. But the cold was too intense to allow us to do so, for I am convinced that at this great altitude the thermometer cannot have marked less than fourteen or fifteen degrees below freezing point. What such a temperature meant to us, enervated as we were by hardship, want of food, and the great heat of the desert, the reader may imagine better than I can describe. Suffice it to say that it was something as near death from exposure as I have ever felt. There we sat, hour after hour, through the still and bitter night, feeling the frost wander round and nip us now in the finger, now in the foot, now in the face. In vain we did huddle up closer and closer. There was no warmth in our miserable starved carcasses. Sometimes one of us would drop into an uneasy slumber for a few minutes, but we could not sleep much. And perhaps this was fortunate, for if we had, I doubt if we should have ever woke again. Indeed, I believe that it was only by force of will that we kept ourselves alive at all. Not very long before dawn I heard the Hottentot Ventvogel, whose teeth had been chattering all night like castanets, give a deep sigh. Then his teeth stopped chattering. I did not think anything of it at the time, concluding that he had gone to sleep. His back was resting against mine, and it seemed to grow colder and colder, till at last it felt like ice. 
At length the air began to grow gray with light, then golden arrows sped across the snow, and at last the glorious sun peeped above the lava wall and looked in upon our half-frozen forms. Also it looked upon Ventvogel, sitting there amongst us, stone dead. No wonder his back felt cold, poor fellow. He had died when I heard him sigh, and was now frozen almost stiff. Shocked beyond measure, we dragged ourselves from the corpse. How strange is that horror we mortals have of the companionship of a dead body, and left it sitting there, its arms clasped about its knees. By this time the sunlight was pouring its cold rays, for here they were cold, straight into the mouth of the cave. Suddenly I heard an exclamation of fear from someone and turned my head. And this is what I saw. Sitting at the end of the cavern, it was not more than twenty feet deep, was another form, of which the head rested on its chest and the long arms hung down. I stared at it and saw that this too was a dead man, and, what was more, a white man. The others saw also and the sight proved too much for our shattered nerves. One and all, we scrambled out of the cave as fast as our half-frozen limbs would carry us. End of Chapter 6 Chapter 7 Solomon's Road Outside the cavern we halted, feeling rather foolish. I am going back, said Sir Henry. Why? asked Good because it has struck me that what we saw may be my brother. This was a new idea, and we re-entered the place to put it to the proof. After the bright light outside, our eyes, weak as they were with staring at the snow, could not pierce the gloom of the cave for a while. Presently, however, they grew accustomed to the semi-darkness, and we advanced towards the dead man. Sir Henry knelt down and peered into his face. Thank God, he said with a sigh of relief, it is not my brother. Then I drew near and looked. The body was that of a tall man in middle life with aquiline features, grizzled hair, and a long black mustache. The skin was perfectly yellow and stretched tightly over the bones. Its clothing with the exception of what seemed to be the remains of a woolen pair of hose, had been removed, leaving the skeleton-like frame naked. Round the neck of the corpse, which was frozen perfectly stiff, hung a yellow ivory crucifix. "'Who on earth can it be?' said I. "'Can't you guess?' asked Good. I shook my head. "'Why, the old Dom!' "'Jose da Silvestra, of course. Who else?' "'Impossible,' I gasped. "'He died three hundred years ago. "'And what is there to prevent him from lasting for three thousand years in this atmosphere, I should like to know?' asked Good. "'If only the temperature is sufficiently low, flesh and blood will keep fresh as New Zealand mutton forever, and heaven knows it is cold enough here.' The sun never gets in here. No animal comes here to tear or destroy. No doubt his slave, of whom he speaks on the writing, took off his clothes and left him. He could not have buried him alone. Look, he went on, stooping down to pick up a queerly shaped bone scraped at the end into a sharp point. Here is the cleft bone that Silvestra used to draw the map with. We gazed for a moment, astonished, forgetting our own miseries in this extraordinary, and as it seemed to us, semi-miraculous sight. Aye, said Sir Henry, and this is where he got his ink from, and he pointed to a small wound on the dom's left arm. Did ever man see such a thing before? There was no longer any doubt about the matter which for my own part, I confess, perfectly appalled me. There he sat, the dead man, whose directions, 
written some ten generations ago, had led us to this spot. Here in my own hand was the rude pen with which he had written them, and about his neck hung the crucifix that his dying lips had kissed. Gazing at him, my imagination could reconstruct the last scene of the drama, the traveller dying of cold and starvation, yet striving to convey to the world the great secret which he had discovered, the awful loneliness of his death, of which the evidence sat before us. It even seemed to me that I could trace in his strongly marked features a likeness to those of my poor friend, Sylvester, his descendant, who had died twenty years before in my arms. But perhaps that was fancy. At any rate, there he sat, a sad memento of the fate that so often overtakes those who would penetrate into the unknown. And there, doubtless, he will still sit, crowned with the dread majesty of death. For centuries yet unborn, to startle the eyes of wanderers like ourselves, if ever any such should come again to invade his loneliness. The thing overpowered us, already almost perished as we were with cold and hunger. Let us go, said Sir Henry in a low voice. Stay, we will give him a companion. And lifting up the dead body of the Hottentot Ventvogel, he placed it near to that of the old Dom. Then he stooped, and with a jerk broke the rotten string of the crucifix, which hung round Da Silvestra's neck, for his fingers were too cold to attempt to unfasten it. I believe that he has it still. I took the bone pen, and it is before me as I write. Sometimes I use it to sign my name. Then, leaving these two, the proud white man of a past age and the poor Hottentot, to keep their eternal vigil in the midst of the eternal snows, we crept out of the cave into the welcome sunshine and resumed our path, wondering in our hearts how many hours it would be before we were even as they are. When we had walked about half a mile, we came to the edge of the plateau, for the nipple of the mountain does not rise out of its exact center, though from the desert side it had seemed to do so. What lay below us we could not see, for the landscape was wreathed in billows of morning fog. Presently, however, the higher layers of mist cleared a little and revealed, at the end of a large slope of snow, a patch of green grass some five hundred yards beneath us, through which a stream was running. Nor was this all. By the stream, basking in the bright sun, stood and lay a group of from ten to fifteen large antelopes. At that distance we could not see of what species. The sight filled us with unreasoning joy. If only we could get it, there was food in plenty. But the question was how to do so. The beasts were fully six hundred yards off, a very long shot, and one not to be depended on when our lives hung on the results. Rapidly we discussed the advisability of trying to stalk the game, but in the end dismissed it reluctantly. To begin with, the wind was not favorable, and further we must certainly be perceived, however careful we were, against the blinding background of snow which we should be obliged to traverse. "'Well, we must have a try from where we are,' said Sir Henry. "'Which shall it be, Quartermain, the repeating rifles or the expresses?' Here again was a question. The Winchester repeaters, of which we had two, Umbopa carrying poor Ventvogels as well as his own, were sighted up to a thousand yards, whereas the expresses were only sighted to 350, beyond which shooting with them was more or less guesswork. On the other hand, if they did hit, the express bullets, being expanding, were much more likely to bring the game down. It was a knotty point, but I made up my mind that we must risk it and use the expresses. Let each of us take the buck opposite to him. Aim well at the point of the shoulder, 
and high up, said I, and Umbopa, do you give the word, so that we may all fire together. Then came a pause, each of us aiming his level best, as indeed a man is likely to do when he knows that life itself depends upon the shot. Fire, said Umbopa in Zulu, and at almost the same instant the three rifles rang out loudly. Three clouds of smoke hung for a moment before us, and a hundred echoes went flying over the silent snow. Presently the smoke cleared and revealed, oh joy, a great buck lying on its back and kicking furiously in its death agony. We gave a yell of triumph. We were saved. We should not starve. Weak as we were, we rushed down the intervening slope of snow, and in ten minutes from the time of shooting, that animal's heart and liver were lying before us. But now a new difficulty arose. We had no fuel, and therefore could make no fire to cook them. We gazed at each other in dismay. Starving men should not be fanciful, said Good. We must eat raw meat. There was no other way out of the dilemma, and our gnawing hunger made the proposition less distasteful than it would otherwise have been. So we took the heart and liver and buried them for a few minutes in a patch of snow to cool them. Then we washed them in the ice-cold water of the stream, and lastly ate them greedily. It sounds horrible enough, but honestly I never tasted anything so good as that raw meat. In a quarter of an hour we were changed men. Our life and vigor came back to us. Our feeble pulses grew strong again, and the blood went coursing through our veins. But mindful of the results of overfeeding on starved stomachs, we were careful not to eat too much, stopping whilst we were still hungry. "'Thank heavens,' said Sir Henry. "'That brute has saved our lives. "'What is it, Quartermain?' "'I rose and went to look at the antelope, for I was not certain. "'It was about the size of a donkey with large curved horns. "'I had never seen one like it before. "'The species was new to me. "'It was brown in color, with faint red stripes, and grew a thick coat.' I afterwards discovered that the natives of that wonderful country call these bucks Inko. They are very rare and only found at a great altitude where no other game will live. This animal was fairly hit high up in the shoulder, though whose bullet brought it down we could not, of course, discover. I believe that Good, mindful of his marvelous shot at the giraffe, secretly set it down to his own prowess, and we did not contradict him. We had been so busy satisfying our hunger that hitherto we had not found time to look about us. But now, having set Umbopa to cut off as much of the best meat as we were likely to be able to carry, we began to inspect our surroundings. The mist had cleared away, for it was eight o'clock, and the sun had sucked it up so we were able to take in all the country before us at a glance. I know not how to describe the glorious panorama which unfolded itself to our gaze. I have never seen anything like it before, nor shall, I suppose, again. Behind and over us towered Sheba's snowy breasts, and below, some five thousand feet beneath where we stood, lay league on league of the most lovely champagne country. Here were dense patches of lofty forest. There a great river wound its silvery way. To the left stretched a vast expanse of rich undulating veld or grassland, whereon we could just make out countless herds of game or cattle. At that distance we could not tell which. This expanse appeared to be ringed in by a wall of distant mountains. To the right, the country was more or less mountainous, that is, solitary hills stood up from its level, with stretches of cultivated land between, amongst which we could see groups of dome-shaped huts. The landscape lay before us as a map, wherein rivers flashed like silver snakes and alp-like peaks, crowned with wildly twisted snow wreaths, rose in grandeur, whilst over all was the glad sunlight and the breath of nature's happy life. 
Two curious things struck us as we gaze. First, that the country before us must lie at least 3,000 feet higher than the desert we had crossed, and secondly, that all the rivers flowed from south to north. As we had painful reason to know, there was no water upon the southern side of the vast range on which we stood, but on the northern face were many streams, most of which appeared to unite with the great river we could see winding away farther than our eyes could follow. We sat down for a while and gazed in silence at this wonderful view. Presently Sir Henry spoke. "'Isn't there something on the map about Solomon's great road?' he said. I nodded, for I was still gazing out over the far country. "'Well, look, there it is.' and he pointed a little to our right. Good and I looked accordingly, and there, winding away towards the plain, was what appeared to be a wide turnpike road. We had not seen it at first, because, on reaching the plain, it turned behind some broken country. We did not say anything, at least not much. We were beginning to lose the sense of wonder. Somehow it did not seem particularly unnatural that we should find a sort of Roman road in this strange land. We accepted the fact, that was all. Well, said Good, must be quite near us if we cut off the, to the right. Hadn't we better be making a start? This was sound advice, and so soon as we had washed our faces and hands in the stream, we acted on it. For a mile or more we made our way over boulders and across patches of snow, till suddenly, on reaching the top of the little rise, we found the road at our feet. It was a splendid road, cut out of the solid rock, at least fifty feet wide, and apparently well kept, though the odd thing was that it seemed to begin there. We walked down and stood on it. But one single hundred paces behind us, in the direction of Sheba's breasts, it vanished, the entire surface of the mountain being strewn with boulders interspaced with patches of snow. "'What do you make of this, Quartermain?' asked Sir Henry. I shook my head. I could make nothing of the thing. "'I have it,' said Good. The road, no doubt, ran right over the range and across the desert on the other side. But the sand there has covered it up, and above us it has been obliterated by some volcanic eruption of molten lava. This seemed a good suggestion. At any rate, we accepted it, and proceeded down the mountain. It proved a very different business, traveling along downhill on that magnificent pathway with full stomachs, from what it was traveling uphill over the snow, quite starved and almost frozen. Indeed, had it not been for melancholy recollections of poor Ventvogel's sad fate, and of that grim cave where he kept company with the old Dom, we should have felt positively cheerful, notwithstanding the sense of unknown dangers before us. Every mile we walked, the atmosphere grew softer and balmier, and the country before us shone with a yet more luminous beauty. As for the road itself, I never saw such an engineering work, though Sir Henry said that the great road over the St. Gothard in Switzerland is very similar. No difficulty had been too great for the old-world engineer who laid it out. At one place we came to a ravine three hundred feet broad and at least a hundred feet deep. This vast gulf was actually filled in with huge blocks of dressed stone, having arches pierced through them at the bottom for a waterway, over which the road went on sublimely. At another place it was cut in zigzags out of the side of a precipice five hundred feet deep, and in a third it tunneled through the base of an intervening ridge, a space of thirty yards or more. Here we noticed that the sides of the tunnel were covered with quaint sculptures, mostly of mailed figures driving in chariots. One, which was exceedingly beautiful, represented a whole battle scene with a convoy of captives being marched off in the distance. 
Well, said Sir Henry, after inspecting this ancient work of art, it is very well to call this Solomon's Road, but my humble opinion is that the Egyptians had been here before Solomon's people ever set a foot on it. If this isn't Egyptian or Phoenician handiwork, I must say that it is very like it. By midday we had advanced sufficiently down the mountain to search the region where wood was to be met with. First we came to scattered bushes, which grew more and more frequent, till at last we found the road winding through a vast grove of silver trees similar to those which are to be seen on the slopes of Table Mountain at Cape Town. I had never before met with them in all my wanderings, except at the Cape, and their appearance here astonished me greatly. Ah, said Good, surveying these shining-leaved trees with evident enthusiasm, here is lots of wood. Let us stop and cook some dinner. I have about digested that raw heart. Nobody objected to this. So leaving the road, we made our way to a stream which was babbling away not far off, and soon had a goodly fire of dry boughs blazing. Cutting off some substantial hunks from the flesh of the inco which we had brought with us, we proceeded to toast them on the end of sharp sticks as one sees the Kaffirs do, and ate them with relish. After filling ourselves, we lit our pipes and gave ourselves up to enjoyment that, compared with the hardships we had recently undergone, seemed almost heavenly. The brook, of which the banks were clothed with dense masses of a gigantic species of maidenhair fern, interspersed with feathery tufts of wild asparagus, "'sung merrily at our side. "'The soft air murmured through the leaves of the silver trees. "'Doves cooed around, "'and bright-winged birds flashed like living gems from bough to bough. "'It was a paradise. "'The magic of the place, "'combined with an overwhelming sense of dangers left behind, "'and of the promised land reached at last, "'seemed to charm us into silence.' Sir Henry and Umbopa sat conversing in a mixture of broken English and kitchen Zulu in a low voice, but earnestly enough, and I lay with my eyes half shut upon that fragrant bed of fern and watched them. Presently I missed good, and I looked to see what had become of him. Soon I observed him sitting by the bank of the stream in which he had been bathing. He had nothing on but his flannel shirt, and his natural habits of extreme neatness having reasserted themselves, he was actively employed in making a most elaborate toilet. He had washed his gutta-percha collar, had thoroughly shaken out his trousers, coat and waistcoat, and was now folding them up neatly till he was ready to put them on, shaking his head sadly as he scanned the numerous rents and tears in them, which naturally had resulted from our frightful journey. Then he took his boots, scrubbed them with a handful of fern, and finally rubbed them over with a piece of fat, which he had carefully saved from the inco meat, till they looked, comparatively speaking, respectable. Having inspected them judiciously through his eyeglass, he put the boots on and began a fresh operation. From a little bag that he carried, he produced a pocket comb, in which was fixed a tiny looking-glass, and in this he surveyed himself. Apparently he was not satisfied, for he proceeded to do his hair with great care. Then came a pause while he again contemplated the effect. Still it was not satisfactory. He felt his chin, on which the accumulated scrub of a ten days beard was flourishing. Surely, thought I, he is not going to try to shave, but so it was. Taking the piece of fat with which he had greased his boots... Good washed it thoroughly in the stream. Then, diving again into the bag, he brought out a little pocket razor with a guard to it, such as are bought by people who are afraid of cutting themselves, or by those about to undertake a sea voyage. Then he rubbed his face and chin vigorously with the fat and began. Evidently, it proved a painful process, for he groaned very much over it, and I was convulsed with inward laughter as I watched him struggling with that stubbly beard. 
It seems so very odd that a man should take the trouble to shave himself with a piece of fat in such a place and in our circumstances. At last he succeeded in getting the hair off the right side of his face and chin, when suddenly I, who was watching, became conscious of a flash of light that passed just by his head. Good sprang up with a profane exclamation. If it had not been a safety razor, he would certainly have cut his throat. And so did I, without the exclamation. And this was what I saw. Standing not more than twenty paces from where I was, and ten from Good, were a group of men. They were very tall and copper-colored, and some of them wore great plumes of black feathers and short cloaks of leopard skins. This was all I noticed at the moment. In front of them stood a youth of about seventeen, his hand still raised and his body bent forward in the attitude of a Grecian statue of a spear-thrower. Evidently the flash of light had been caused by a weapon which he had hurled. As I looked, an old soldier-like man stepped forward out of the group, and catching the youth by the arm said something to him. Then they advanced upon us. Sir Henry, Good, and Umbopa by this time had seized their rifles and lifted them threateningly. The party of natives still came on. It struck me that they could not know what rifles were, or they would not have treated them with such contempt. "'Put down your guns!' I hallowed to the others, seeing that our only chance of safety lay in conciliation. They obeyed, and walking to the front I addressed the elderly man who had checked the youth. "'Greetings,' I said in Zulu, not knowing what language to use. To my surprise I was understood. "'Greeting,' answered the old man, not indeed in the same tongue, but in a dialect so closely allied to it that neither Umbopa nor myself had any difficulty in understanding him. Indeed, as we afterwards found out, the language spoken by this people is an old-fashioned form of the Zulu tongue, bearing about the same relationship to it that the English of Chaucer does to the English of the nineteenth century. "'Whence come you?' he went on. "'Who are you, and why are the faces of three of you white, "'and the face of the fourth as the face of our mother's sons?' "'And he pointed to Umbopa. "'I looked at Umbopa as he said it, "'and it flashed across me that he was right. "'The face of Umbopa was like the faces of the men before me, "'and so was his great form like their forms.' "'but I had not time to reflect on this coincidence. "'We are strangers and come in peace,' I answered, "'speaking very slowly, so that he might understand me. "'And this man is our servant.' "'You lie,' he answered. "'No strangers can cross the mountains where all things perish. "'But what do your lies matter? "'If ye are strangers, then ye must die, "'for no strangers may live in the land of the Cucuanas. It is the king's law. Prepare then to die, O strangers. I was slightly staggered at this, more especially as I saw the hands of some of the men steal down to their sides, where hung on each what looked to me like a large and heavy knife. What does the beggar say? asked Good. He says we are going to be killed, I answered grimly. Oh, Lord, groaned Good. And, as was his way, when perplexed, he put his hand to his false teeth, dragging the top set down and allowing them to fly back to his jaw with a snap. It was a most fortunate move, for next second the dignified crowd of Kukuanas uttered a simultaneous yell of horror and bolted back some yards. "'What's up?' said I. "'It's his teeth,' whispered Sir Henry excitedly. "'He moved them.' "'Take them out, Good. Take them out.' "'He obeyed, slipping the set into the sleeve of his flannel shirt. "'In another second, curiosity had overcome fear, and the men advanced slowly. "'Apparently they had now forgotten their amiable intention of killing us. "'How is it, O oh strangers?' asked the old man solemnly. "'That this fat man,' pointing to Good, who was clad in nothing but boots and a flannel shirt, and had only half finished his shaving, whose body is clothed and whose legs are bare, 
who grows hair on one side of his sickly face and not on the other, and who wears one shining and transparent eye, how is it, I ask, that he has teeth which move of themselves, coming away from the jaws and returning of their own will? Open your mouth, I said to Good, who promptly curled up his lips and grinned at the old gentleman like an angry dog, revealing to his astonished gaze two thin red lines of gum as utterly innocent of ivories as a newborn elephant. The audience gasped. "'Where are his teeth?' they shouted. "'With our eyes we saw them.' Turning his head slowly and with a gesture of ineffable contempt, Good swept his hand across his mouth. Then he grinned again, and lo, there were two rows of lovely teeth. Now the young man who had flung the knife threw himself down on the grass and gave vent to a prolonged howl of terror, and as for the old gentleman, his knees knocked together with fear. "'I see that ye are spirits,' he said falteringly. "'Did ever man born of woman have hair on one side of his face and not on the other, or a round and transparent eye, or teeth which moved and melted away and grew again?' Pardon us, O oh my lords. Here was luck indeed, and needless to say, I jumped at the chance. It is granted, I said with an imperial smile. Nay, ye shall know the truth. We come from another world, though we are men such as ye. We come, I went on, from the biggest star that shines at night. Oh, oh, groaned the chorus of astonished aborigines. Yes, I went on, we do indeed, and again I smiled benignly as I uttered that amazing lie. We come to stay with you a little while, and to bless you by our sojourn. Ye will see, O oh friends, that I have prepared myself for this visit by the learning of your language. It is so, it is so, said the chorus. Only, my lord, put in the old gentleman, Thou hast learned it very badly. I cast an indignant glance at him, and he quailed. Now, friends, I continued, ye might think that after so long a journey we should find it in our hearts to avenge such a reception. Mayhap to strike cold in death the imperious hand that, that in short, threw a knife at the head of him whose teeth come and go. Spare him, my lords, said the old man in supplication. He is the king's son, and I am his uncle. If anything befalls him, his blood will be required at my hands. Yes, that is certainly so, put in the young man with great emphasis. Ye may perhaps doubt our power to avenge, I went on, heedless of this by-play. Stay, I will show you. Here, thou dog and slave, addressing Umbopa in a savage tone. Give me the magic tube that speaks, and I tipped a wink towards my express rifle. Umbopa rose to the occasion, and with something as nearly resembling a grin as I have ever seen on his dignified face, he handed me the gun. It is here, O Lord of Lords, he said, with a deep obeisance. Now just before I had asked for the rifle, I had perceived a little... Clipspringer antelope, standing on a mass of rock about seventy yards away, and determined to risk the shot. "'You see that buck?' I said, pointing the animal out to the party before me. "'Tell me, is it possible for man born of woman to kill it from here with a noise?' "'It is not possible, my lord,' answered the old man. "'Yet shall I kill it?' I said quietly. The old man smiled. "'That my lord cannot do,' he answered. I raised the rifle and covered the buck. It was a small animal, and one which a man might well be excused for missing, but I knew that it would not do to miss. I drew a deep breath and slowly pressed on the trigger. The buck stood still as a stone. Bang! Thud! The antelope sprang into the air and fell on the rock dead as a doornail. 
a groan of simultaneous terror burst from the group before us. "'If you want meat,' I remarked coolly, "'go fetch that buck.' The old man made a sign, and one of his followers departed, and presently returned, bearing the clipspringer. I noticed with satisfaction that I had hit it fairly behind the shoulder. They gathered round the poor creature's body, gazing at the bullet hole in consternation. "'Ye see,' I said, "'I do not speak empty words.' There was no answer. "'If ye yet doubt our power,' I went on, "'let one of you go and stand upon that rock "'that I may make him as this buck.' "'None of them seemed at all inclined to take the hint, "'till at last the king's son spoke. "'It is well said. "'Do thou, my uncle, go stand upon the rock. "'It is but a buck that the magic has killed. "'Surely it cannot kill a man.' The old gentleman did not take the suggestion in good part. Indeed, he seemed hurt. No, no, he ejaculated hastily. My old eyes have seen enough. These are wizards indeed. Let us bring them to the king. Yet if any should wish a further proof, let him stand upon the rock, that the magic tube may speak with him. There was a most general and hasty expression of dissent. "'Let not good magic be wasted on our poor bodies,' said one. "'We are satisfied. "'All the witchcraft of our people cannot show the like of this.' "'It is so,' remarked the old gentleman, in a tone of intense relief. "'Without any doubt, it is so. "'Listen, children of the stars, "'children of the shining eye and the movable teeth, "'who roar out in thunder and slay from afar. "'I am Infadus, son of Kafa once king of the Kukuana people. This youth is Scraga. He nearly scragged me, murmured Good. Scraga, son of Twala, the great king. Twala, husband of a thousand wives, chief and lord paramount of the Kukuanas, keeper of the great road, terror of his enemies, student of the black arts, leader of a hundred thousand warriors. Twala, the one-eyed, the black, the terrible. So, said I superciliously, lead us then to Twala. We do not talk with low people and underlings. It is well, my lords, we will lead you, but the way is long. We are hunting three days' journey from the place of the king. But let my lords have patience, and we will lead them. So be it, I said carelessly. All time is before us, for we do not die. We are ready. Lead on. But in Fadus and thou, Scraga, beware. Play no monkey tricks. Set for us no fox's snares. For before your brains of mud have thought of them, we shall know and avenge. The light of the transparent eye of him with the bare legs and the half-haired face shall destroy you and go through your land. His vanishing teeth shall affix themselves fast in you and eat you up, you and your wives and children. The magic tubes shall argue with you loudly and make you as sieves. Beware. This magnificent address did not fail of its effects. Indeed, it might almost have been spared, so deeply were our friends already impressed with our powers. The old man made a deep obeisance, and murmured the words, Kum, Kum, which I afterwards discovered was their royal salute, corresponding to the Baete of the Zulus, and turning addressed his followers. These at once proceeded to lay hold of all our goods and chattels in order to bear them for us, accepting only the guns which they would on no account touch. They even seized goods' clothes, that, as the reader may remember, were neatly folded up beside him. He saw and made a dive for them, and a loud altercation ensued. Let not my lord of the transparent eye and the melting teeth touch them, said the old man. Surely his slave shall carry the things. But I want to put them on, roared Good in nervous English. Umbopa translated. 
"'Nay, my lord,' answered Infadus. "'Would my lord cover up his beautiful white legs? "'Although he is so dark, good has a singularly white skin. "'From the eye of his servants, "'have we offended my lord that he should do such a thing?' "'Here I nearly exploded with laughing, "'and meanwhile one of the men started on with the garments. "'Damn it!' roared good. "'That black villain has got my trousers!' "'Look here, good,' said Sir Henry. "'You have appeared in this country in a certain character, "'and you must live up to it. "'It will never do for you to put on trousers again. "'Henceforth you must exist in a flannel shirt, "'a pair of boots, and an eyeglass.' "'Yes,' I said, "'and with whiskers on one side of your face and not on the other.' If you change any of these things, the people will think that we are impostors. I am very sorry for you, but seriously, you must. If once they begin to suspect us, our lives will not be worth a brass farthing. Do you really think so? said Good gloomily. I do indeed. Your beautiful white legs and your eyeglass are now the features of our party. "'and as Sir Henry says, you must live up to them. "'Be thankful that you've got your boots on "'and that the air is warm.' "'Good sighed and said no more, "'but it took him a fortnight "'to become accustomed to his new and scant attire. "'End of Chapter 7 "'Chapter 8 "'We Enter Kukuana Land all that afternoon we traveled along the magnificent roadway, which trended steadily in the northwesterly direction. Infadus and Skraga walked with us, but their followers marched about one hundred paces ahead. Infadus, I said at length, who made this road? It was made, my lord, of old time, none know how or when, not even the wise woman Gagul, who has lived for generations. We are not old enough to remember its making. None can fashion such roads now, but the king suffers no grass to grow upon it. And whose are the writings on the wall of the caves through which we have passed on the road, I asked, referring to the Egyptian-like sculptures that we had seen. My lord, the hands that made the road wrote the wonderful writings, we know not who wrote them. When did the Kukuana people come into this country? My lord, the race came down here like the breath of a storm ten thousand thousand moons ago, from the great lands which lie there beyond, and he pointed to the north. They could travel no further because of the high mountains which ring in the land, so say the old voices of our fathers that have descended to us the children, and so says Gagul the wise woman, the smeller out of witches. And again he pointed to the snow-clad peaks. The country, too, was good, so they settled here, and grew strong and powerful, and now our numbers are like the sea-sand. And when Twala the king calls up his regiments, their plumes cover the plain so far as the eye of man can reach. And if the land is walled in with mountains, who is there for the regiments to fight with? Nay, my lord, the country is open there towards the north, and now and again warriors sweep down upon us in clouds from a land we know not, and we slay them. It is the third part of the life of a man since there was a war. Many thousands died in it, but we destroyed those who came to eat us up. So since then there has been no war. Your warriors must grow weary of resting on their spears, Infadus. My lord, there was one war just after we destroyed the people that came down upon us. But it was a civil war. Dog ate dog. How was that? My lord the king, my half-brother, had a brother born at the same birth and of the same woman. It is not our custom, my lord, to suffer twins to live. The weaker always must die. But the mother of the king hid away the feeble child, which was born the last. 
for her heart yearned over it, and that child is Twala, the king. I am his younger brother, born of another wife. Well, my lord Kafa, our father, died when we came to manhood, and my brother Imotu was made king in his place, and for a space reigned and had a son by his favorite wife. When the babe was three years old, just after the great war, during which no man could sow or reap, a famine came upon the land, and the people murmured because of the famine, and looked round like a starved lion for something to rend. Then it was that Gagool, the wise and terrible woman, who does not die, made a proclamation to the people, saying, The king Imotu is no king. And at the time Imotu was sick with a wound and lay in his kraal, not able to move. Then Gagool went into a hut and led out Twala, my half-brother and twin-brother to the king, whom she had hidden among the caves and rocks since he was born, and stripping the muka waistcloth off his loins, showed the people of the Kukuanas the mark of the sacred snake coiled round his middle, wherewith the eldest son of the king is marked at birth, and cried out loud, Behold your king whom I have saved for you even to this day. Now the people being mad with hunger, and altogether bereft of reason and the knowledge of truth, cried out, The king! The king! But I knew that it was not so, for Emotu, my brother, was the elder of the twins, and our lawful king. Then, just as the tumult was at its height, Emotu, the king, though he was very sick, crawled from his hut, holding his wife by the hand, and followed by his little son, Ignosi, that is, by interpretation, the lightning, "'What is this noise?' he asked. "'Why cry ye, the king, the king?' "'Then Twala, his twin brother, born of the same woman and in the same hour, "'ran to him, and taking him by the hair, stabbed him through the heart with his knife. "'And the people, being fickle and ever ready to worship the rising sun, "'clapped their hands and cried, "'Twala is king. Now we know that Twala is king.' And what became of Imotu's wife and her son Ignosi? Did Twala kill them too? Nay, my lord. When she saw that her lord was dead, the queen seized the child with a cry and ran away. Two days afterward she came to a kraal very hungry, and none would give her milk or food now that her lord the king was dead, for all men hate the unfortunate. But at nightfall... A little child, a girl, crept out and brought her corn to eat, and she blessed the child, and went on towards the mountains with her boy before the sun rose again. And there she must have perished, for none have seen her since, nor the child Ignosi. Then if this child Ignosi had lived, he would be the true king of the Kukuana people? That is so, my lord, the sacred snake is round his middle. If he lives, he is king. But alas, he is long dead. See, my lord, and Infadus pointed to a vast collection of huts surrounded by a fence, which was in its turn encircled by a great ditch that lay on the plain beneath us. That is the kraal where the wife of Imotu was last seen with the child Ignosi. It is there that we shall sleep tonight, if indeed, he added doubtfully, my lord, sleep it all upon this earth. When we are among the Kukuanas, my good friend in Fadus, we do as the Kukuanas do, I said majestically, and turned round quickly to address Good, who was tramping along sullenly behind, his mind fully occupied with unsatisfactory attempts to prevent his flannel shirt from flapping in the evening breeze. To my astonishment, I butted into Umbopa, who was walking along immediately behind me, and very evidently had been listening with the greatest interest to my conversation with Infadus. The expression on his face was most curious, and gave me the idea of a man who was struggling with partial success to bring something long forgotten back into his mind. 
All this while we had been pressing on at a good rate towards the undulating plain beneath us. The mountains we had crossed now loomed high above our heads, and Sheba's breasts were veiled modestly in diaphanous wreaths of mist. As we went the country grew more and more lovely. The vegetation was luxuriant without being tropical. The sun was bright and warm, but not burning, and a gracious breeze blew softly along the odorous slopes of the mountain. Indeed, this new land was little less than an earthly paradise. In beauty, in natural wealth, and in climate, I have never seen its like. The Transvaal is a fine country, but it is nothing to Kukuanaland. So soon as we started, Infadus had dispatched a runner to warn the people of the corral, which, by the way, was in his military command, of our arrival. This man had departed at an extraordinary speed, which Infadus informed me he would keep up all the way, as running was an exercise much practiced among his people. The result of this message now became apparent. When we arrived within two miles of the corral, we could see that company after company of men were issuing from its gates and marching towards us. Sir Henry laid his hand upon my arm and remarked that it looked as though we were going to meet with a warm reception. Something in his tone attracted Infadus's attention. "'Let not my lords be afraid,' he said hastily, "'for in my breast there dwells no guile.' This regiment is one under my command and comes out by my orders to greet you. I nodded easily, though I was not quite easy in my mind. About half a mile from the gates of this corral is a long stretch of rising ground sloping gently upward from the road, and here the companies formed. It was a splendid sight to see them, each company about three hundred strong, charging swiftly up the rise, with flashing spears and waving plumes, to take their appointed places. By the time we reached the slope, twelve such companies, or in all three thousand six hundred men, had passed out and taken up their positions along the road. Presently we came to the first company, and were able to gaze in astonishment on the most magnificent set of warriors that I have ever seen. They were all men of mature age, mostly veterans of about forty, and not one of them was under six feet in height, whilst many stood six feet three or four. They wore upon their heads heavy black plumes of sacabula feathers, like those which adorned our guides. About their waists and beneath the right knees were bound circlets of white oxtails, while in their left hands they carried round shields measuring about twenty inches across. These shields are very curious. The framework is made of an iron plate beaten out thin, over which is stretched milk-white oxhide. The weapons that each man bore were simple, but most effective, consisting of a short and very heavy two-edged spear with a wooden shaft, the blade being about six inches across at the widest part. These spears are not used for throwing, but, like the Zulu Banguan, or stabbing Asagai, are for close quarters only, when the wound inflicted by them is terrible. In addition to his Banguan, every man carried three large and heavy knives, each knife weighing about two pounds. One knife was fixed in the oxtail girdle, and the other two at the back of the round shield. These knives, which are called tolas by the Kukuanas, take the place of the throwing assegai of the Zulus. The Kukuana warriors can cast them with great accuracy to a distance of fifty yards, and it is their custom on charging to hurl a volley of them at the enemy as they come to close quarters. Each company remained still as a collection of bronze statues till we were opposite to it, when, at a signal given by its commanding officer, who, distinguished by a leopard-skin cloak, stood some paces in front, every spear was raised into the air, and from three hundred throats sprang forth with a sudden roar the royal salute of Kum. Then, so soon as we had passed, the company formed up behind us and followed us towards the corral. 
till at last the whole regiment of the Greys, so called from their white shields, the cracked troops of the Kukuana people, was marching in our rear with a tread that shook the ground. At length, branching off from Solomon's great road, we came to the wide fosse surrounding the corral, which is at least a mile round, and fenced with a strong palisade of piles formed of the trunks of trees. At the gateway this fosse is spanned by a primitive drawbridge, which was let down by the guard to allow us to pass in. The corral is exceedingly well laid out. Through the center runs a wide pathway, intersected at right angles by other pathways, so arranged as to cut the huts into square blocks, each block being the quarters of a company. The huts are dome-shaped and built, like those of the Zulus, of a framework of wattle, beautifully thatched with grass, but unlike the Zulu huts, they have doorways through which men could walk. Also they are much larger, and surrounded by a veranda about six feet wide, beautifully paved with powdered lime trodden hard. All along each side of this wide pathway that pierces the corral were ranged hundreds of women brought out by curiosity to look at us. These women, for a native race, are exceedingly handsome. They are tall and graceful, and their figures are wonderfully fine. The hair, though short, is rather curly than woolly. The features are frequently aquiline, and the lips are not unpleasantly thick, as is the case among most African races. But what struck us most was their exceedingly quiet and dignified air. They were as well-bred in their way as the habitués of a fashionable drawing-room and in this respect they differ from Zulu women and their cousins the Maasai, who inhabit the district beyond Zanzibar. Their curiosity had brought them out to see us, but they allowed no rude expressions of astonishment or savage criticism to pass their lips as we trudged wearily in front of them. Not even when old Infadus, with a surreptitious motion of the hand, pointed out the crowning wonder of poor Good's beautiful white legs, did they suffer the feeling of intense admiration which evidently mastered their minds to find expression. They fixed their dark eyes upon this new and snowy loveliness, for, as I think I have said, Good's skin is exceedingly white, and that was all, but it was quite enough for Good, who is modest by nature. When we reached the center of the corral, Infadus halted at the door of a large hut, which was surrounded at a distance by a circle of smaller ones. Enter, sons of the stars, he said in a magniloquent voice, and deign to rest a while in our humble habitations. A little food shall be brought to you, so that ye may have no need to draw your belts tight from hunger. Some honey and some milk and an ox or two and a few sheep. Not much, my lords, but still a little food. It is good, said I. In Fadus, we are weary with traveling through realms of air. Now let us rest. Accordingly, we entered the hut, which we found amply prepared for our comfort. Couches of tanned skins were spread for us to lie on, and water was placed for us to wash in. Presently we heard a shouting outside, and stepping to the door saw a line of damsels bearing milk and roasted mealies and honey in a pot. Behind these were some youths driving a fat young ox. We received the gifts, and then one of the young men drew the knife from his girdle and dexterously cut the ox's throat. In ten minutes it was dead, skinned, and jointed. The best of the meat was then cut off for us, and the rest, in the name of our party, I presented to the warriors round us, who took it and distributed the white lord's gift. Umbopa set to work, with the assistance of an extremely prepossessing young woman, to boil our portion in a large earthenware pot over a fire which was built outside the hut. And when it was nearly ready, we sent a message to Infadus and asked him and Scraga, the king's son, to join us. Presently they came, and sitting down upon little stools, of which there were several about the hut, 
for the Kukuanas do not, in general, squat upon their haunches like the Zulus, they helped us to get through our dinner. The old gentleman was most affable and polite, but it struck me that the young one regarded us with doubt. Together with the rest of the party, he had been overawed by our white appearance and our magic properties, but it seemed to me that, on discovering that we ate, drank, and slept like other mortals, his awe was beginning to wear off, and to be replaced by a sullen suspicion, which made me feel rather uncomfortable. In the course of our meal, Sir Henry suggested to me that it might be well to try to discover if our hosts knew anything of his brother's fate, or if they had ever seen or heard of him. But on the whole, I thought it would be wiser to say nothing of the matter at this time. It was difficult to explain a relative lost from the stars. After supper, we produced our pipes and lit them a proceeding which filled Infadus and Scraga with astonishment. The Kukuanas were evidently unacquainted with the divine delights of tobacco smoke. The herb is grown among them extensively, but, like the Zulus, they use it for snuff only, and quite fail to identify it in its new form. Presently I asked Infadus when we were to proceed on our journey, and was delighted to learn that preparations had been made for us to leave on the following morning, messengers having already departed to inform Twala the king of our coming. It appeared that Twala was at his principal place, known as Lu, making ready for the great annual feast which was to be held in the first week of June. At this gathering all the regiments, with the exception of certain detachments left behind for garrison purposes, are brought up and paraded before the king, and the great annual witch-hunt, of which more by and by, is held. We were to start at dawn, and Infadus, who was to accompany us, expected that we should reach Lou on the night of the second day, unless we were detained by accident or by swollen rivers. When they had given us this information, our visitors bade us good night, and having arranged to watch turn turn about, three of us flung ourselves down and slept the sweet sleep of the weary, whilst the fourth sat up on the lookout for possible treachery. End of chapter 8